nothing more excellent nor more valuable than wine was ever granted to mankind by God. Plato. Wine, because no great story started with a salad, as the good old meme says. Hello! Welcome back to another archaeogastronomical adventure with me, Thomas Dinas. This is the Delicious Legacy Podcast. And together we explore tastes and flavors and dishes from the ancient and not so ancient past. On today's episode, we are continuing our exploration into wine's history, myths and legends of how wine was produced in the ancient world. Today, we are traveling deep to ancient Greece and uh, we'll explore many different ancient grape and wine varieties and check the overall wine culture in the ancient Greek world all across the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. Enjoy! The epic journey of Greek wine spans a remarkably long period of time in the annals of history. When it comes to vine cultivation and wine production on an uninterrupted basis, that period is perhaps as long as some others worldwide, like in Lebanon, Turkey and Georgia. The beginnings of wine growing in the Greek mainland may lay well beyond the annals of recorded history and are lost in the mists of time. Since time immemorial, vine and wine have faithfully traveled together with Greece and its inhabitants. The drink was worshipped through the eons, and it was steeped in mystical and religious symbolism. A liquid companion to man in sorrow and joy, a beverage that did indeed begin its legendary journey somewhere east of the eastern shores of Minor Asia. Though it was welcomed into the ancient Greeks' lives from Phoenicia around four and a half thousand years ago, through Crete, as we've seen on the previous episode, Greeks have ever since both cultivated and worshipped it with a remarkable consistency, even through the toughest and darkest hours of uh, their long history. In ancient Greece, the master of the house would open the festivity known as an agape, literally meaning love in the sense of friendship, by pouring a libation of wine. For once, the wine was served neat, without water, and very little of it was drunk. Before any of the guests raised it to their lips, the host emptied a cup of wine on the sacred family hearth, as the serf for the gods, those of the hearth and all the others too. Then everyone sang a hymn to Dionysus. Once these proprietary offerings have been made with fervor, a kind of an aperitif was served, wine flavored with aromatics, served in an enormous drinking cup, which passed from lip to lip. This cup was the one to which Alcibiades refers in Plato's symposium upon arriving at the party. He was ready to drink its contents by himself. Let them bring a big cup agathon, if you have got one. No, never mind. Bring that wine cooler, he went on, seeing one that held more than half a gallon. He had this filled and first of all drained it himself and then told them to fill it again for Socrates, adding as he did so. Not that my skimming will have the slightest effect on Socrates, my friends. He will drink any quantity that he is bid, and he never be drunk all the same. The servant refilled the vessel for Socrates, and then drank. The lord of the feast, which was called the Symposiarch, personally supervised the dilution of wine to be drunk at his table. In Homer's Iliad, for example, when Achilles received the ambassadors of Agamemnon at dinner, 
he told his best friend Patroclus. Set forth a larger bowl, thou son of Menosius, mingle stronger drink, and prepare each man a cup. Much later, obviously, from the Homeric times, in Plato's time, however, it was usual for the symposiarch to order slaves to pour wine and water into a crater, which we shall see later on on our episode what a crater is, like a huge mixing bowl, uh, usually in the exact proportions of two-fifths wine to three-fifths water. The heaviness of the Greek wine explains the generous uh, amount of water. Of course, the end product still had uh, its effect on the guests, but slowly, longer over the course of the whole night perhaps. So people would be merry, but uh, slower. Uh, um, and yeah, by the end of the night, of course, if they drank enough wine, they would be drunk. Neat wine, before it was mixed in the crater, was called Akratos. Akratos Inus. This brings us neatly <laughs> to the subject of the symposium. The symposium basically means to drink together, right? For example, in Plato's Symposium, where the scene I read above is, makes a praiseworthy attempt at a realistic ambience, depicts the gradual arrival of several wholly unexpected guests, some more drunk than others, of course, all of whom the host is prepared to welcome. They double up on the couches in the room called Andron. Symposium was a really important moment uh, for the ancient Greeks. This was when people were coming together and it was obviously a man's space and a man's uh, thing. The space, the room was called, as we've seen above, Andron. Couches were put in three of the walls of the Andron, as the fourth wall, we presume it was the door. And this was an exclusive male affair and an exclusive affair in general, like a dozen people or so would attend. The guests and the host, of course, at some point they were leaning on the left arm in the couches, so physically you were more on view. Um, also that sounds and looks and seems to be quite uncomfortable for us. That was the natural pose that the ancient Greeks would uh, have uh, on a symposium. They would lie on the couch, left arm, leaning on the left arm and being visibly uh, and physically on view and yeah they were talking and discussing with one another and everyone if you think about it everyone is equally on display and all are at the same height and all looking at one another so one group promotes and encourages equality yeah and also it wasn't only the Greeks uh, that had symposiums uh, Etruscans for example had symposiums too Etruscans were the ancient Italians before the Romans conquered the whole of uh, Italy. And the Etruscans um, were allowing men and women to attend the symposiums. So there were different customs from different places along the Mediterranean. Historians think, of course, that this, this was a natural evolution of how communities come together. So yeah, one of the things that people said for the Greek wine was that Greek wine was made in very strong form and uh, needed to be watered down. The host, or what we call symposiarch, would decide what quantities would be of water and wine. It seems that the Greeks did not customarily drink wine while eating the main course of their meals. So at dinner, after the first tables were cleared away, a libation of unmixed wine was poured and tasted. With the second table came more wine, mixed with water, as we've seen, but our friend and hero Archestratus thought that to take wine without eating anything alongside, it was uncivilized. The proper accompaniments included both savory foods and trigemata. Among savories, Archestratus suggests sausages, sauce womb, and small birds roasted. The dinner party thus became a drinking party or symposium. Luckily for us, myriad of vessels survive from across the whole of the Mediterranean, of the ancient Mediterranean world, both Greek 
and of course further away from um, from Greece, like the Etruscans or um, or even from um, more northern barbarian places. So myriad of uh, vessels related with the wine and the wine culture survive, and from which uh, we learn a lot about that said culture and how important it was. Even more so about the potters themselves as well. Uh, the potters and the skills they had, they were highly regarded and they were very, very technical in their work. They created and painted the vessels to hold the wine. So let's see some of the vessels that um, the ancient Greeks used for, for the wine, for serving wine in a symposium. And uh, on my Patreon, I'll put uh, some uh, images and links about how this looked in a bit more detail. First of all, we have something called kylix. It was a two-handled cup with a stemmed base. In the pottery of ancient Greece, a kylix is the most common type of wine drinking cup. It has a broad, relatively shallow body, raised on a stem from a foot, and usually two horizontal handles disposed symmetrically. And it's one of the most popular pottery forms from Mycenaean times through the classical Athenian period. There was usually a painted frieze around the outer surface, depicting a subject from mythology or everyday life, and on the bottom of the inside, a painting often depicting a dancing or drinking scene. Kilikes were often produced in sets to accompany a crater. It's a very funny thing, Kylix, if one thinks about it. Kylix is a drinking cup that makes drinking difficult. A chance, perhaps, to perform how one behaves. Basically, trying not to spill wine on oneself. You must know how to handle this vessel in order to demonstrate to your social group that you clearly belong with them and that you are worthy to be there. A second item, a second vessel of uh, wine serving in Greece was the crater. A crater was a bowl, uh, an ancient Greek vessel which used to, for diluting the wine with water. It usually stood on a tripod in the dining room, or in the andron, as we said, where the wine was mixed. Craters were made of metal or pottery and were often painted or elaborately ornamented. In Homer's Iliad, the prize offered by Achilles for the foot race at Patroclus' funeral games was a silver crater of Sidonian workmanship. The Greek historian Herodotus describes many enormous and costly craters dedicated at temples or used in religious ceremonies to hold libations. Craters are large, with a broad body and a base and usually wide mouth. They may have horizontal handles placed near the base or vertical handles rising from the shoulder. Among the many variations are the bell crater, confined to red figure pottery, shaped like an inverted bell, with loop handles and a disc foot. The volute crater, which is an egg-shaped body and handles that rise from the shoulder and curl in a volute scroll-shaped form, well above the rim. And the calyx crater, the shape of which spreads out like the cup or the calyx of a flower. And the column crater, with columnar handles rising from the shoulder to a flat, projecting lip rim. Another item is the Inohoi, which is a wine jug. It was a graceful vessel with delicately curved handle and trefoil-shaped mouth, where the mixed wine would be then served to individual cups. The Inohoi was revived during the Renaissance and again during the neoclassical period of the 18th century. Inohoi was uh, intermediate in size between a pithos or amphora and individual cups or bowls and it held fluid for several persons temporarily, until it would be poured. The term inos, which means wine, appears first in Mycenaean Greek. In Ohoi, it is a single-handled vessel, usually taller than it is wide. Beasley identified ten types, based on variations of profile, mouth type, such as trefoil, round or beaked, and handle form. One such is the hus, plural hoes, plum shape with a smooth profile and trefoil mouth. Finally, Psichter was a wine cooler. 
and I'm not very sure about the pronunciation here, I must admit. Uh, but anyway, Psichter had a tall cylindrical foot, a rounded body and short neck. It was used for cooling wine. It was filled with wine and it could be placed inside a larger vessel, such as a crater, which had been filled with snow. Or the Psichter itself might be filled with snow and placed inside a larger vessel containing the wine. Incidentally, um, in the symposium also involved games, tricks, singing and music and poetry and all played a role on, on, that, uh, on the entertainment of the night. And one of the favorite um, party games of classical Greece was something called Kotavos, which um, the game consisted of uh, tossing an almost empty wine cup with the finger in such a way as to project the last drops of wine at a target. The target generally of earthenware, was either floating in a bowl of water or balanced on a stand. And the object was to sink the target or make it fall. Typical prizes, which were called kotabia, were trajemata, such as nuts and raisins or kisses. In later times, when the game had fallen out of fashion, kotabia were prizes for any society game. As a jockey metaphor, the verb kotabizin came to mean not play kotavos, but uh, vomit. Many vase paintings show the game in progress or depict men or women in the act of tossing a wine cup. Quotations supplied by Athenaeus give additional details. Some said that in the old days, the target was a slave. So we've seen what kind of... Um, vessels the ancient Greeks used to serve their wine, but um, in terms of um, ancient Greek grape varieties, what do we have? What do we know? The ancient Greek grape varieties come from, um, of course, they come from a lot of quite diverse uh, ancient sources and sometimes clashing with each other. Pliny, for example, so the Roman writer Pliny, cites uh, Democritus, the Greek philosopher, as believing that the grape varieties of Greece could be counted. On the same text, Pliny also says other people regarded them as unaccountable and infinite. As you can see, always things with the ancient writers aren't a very simple or clear cut. They never give us a straight answer. There is some evidence that, as has happened again in more recent times, the great range of varieties resulted partly from crossing with local races of wild grape as vine cultivation spread around the ancient world. Varieties were developed and selected for suitability to particular climates and soils. And for example, for heavy cropping as well, or for the suitability of the grape for marketing fresh or for drying as raisins, and for the flavor and other qualities of the wine that could be made from them, either alone or blended with other wines and other varieties. The rapidity of development in this technical field is indicated by Pliny's information as to the number of varieties which are clearly named after specific places. But these uh, varieties, they're not grown in those places, having been completely replaced by others that they were found to do better. A second direct indication of the rapid spread of varieties is the following um, quotation, also from Pliny. Within the last seven years, there was discovered at Alba Helvia in Provence a wine whose blossoms are normally shed within a single day, rendering it very secure against bad weather. They call it Carbonica, and the whole province now grows it. The names given in classical sources can represent only a small proportion of the varieties that existed, and they are the ones that spread beyond their place of origin and became known as sources of fine wine or for table grapes. Names and spellings varied also, as they do nowadays. So I'm going to make an attempt to discuss some varieties significant over the wider Hellenic world and mentioned in literature. Today's episode is brought to you 
with the welcome support of Malbin Greek, UK's leading Greek delicatessen, supplier and distributor of premium Greek produce, be it wine, herbs, cheeses or olive oil, from all over the wild corners of the country, and working directly with family and artisan producers. Why not, or wine not, try the Ktima Vuvukeli Limnio, a red wine from Avdira, North Greece, the homeland of Democritus. Limnio is a truly ancient and very much praised red wine since antiquity and from no other than Aristotle himself. Deep red, framboise color with red forest fruits in the aroma along with black pepper, cardamom and curry notes, spicy texture and long aftertaste. Or if you prefer a white wine, then the special Domaine Sigala's Barrel Sandorini PDO Assyrtico is for you. A barrel fermented Assyrtico which demonstrates the aging qualities of the variety deep lemon color and a complex nose with citrus fruits and wood notes, round and smooth in the mouth with the acidity being the backbone that allows it to age. The vines are classified as old vines and are over 50 years in age. The rejuvenation of the vineyards employs the same technique from antiquity to the present day. This is truly a unique wine that deserves to be more well known. Whatever you need, Malbian Greek has you covered. You can shop online and have the divine and delicious goods delivered to your doorstep across the UK or you can visit the shop at Art17 Apollo Business Park, Lucy Way, SC16, 4ET, Bermondsey, London, Malby and Greek, the one-stop shop for your Greek fix. For example, in the island of Lemnos, the North East Aegean, Wine commerce in antiquity was so brisk as to earn the island mentions in the Homeric epics. The island's Lemnio cultivar, the Lemnia of antiquity, is still planted today as well as in the vineyards of northern Greece. From the times of the Ottoman rule on, the island became inextricably linked to the cultivation of Muscat of Alexandria, whose yields still go toward the production of the island's dessert wines. And we will check the variety of uh, Lemnius and the Lemnio wine in a bit. On the eastern Aegean island of Lesbos, with its capital Mytilene, the fragrant black sweet wine, which bore the same name as the island, vied for quality and fame with the wine from neighborhood Chios. It remained commercially successful for many centuries on end. Today, compared to the thriving production of the island's famous Uzo, the island's wine production appears meager. Moving on to Chios, the Ariusius Enos was produced in antiquity, a wine whose fame and quality, according to most connoisseurs of the times, surpassed those of any other for many centuries. However, wine growing was extinguished after the Ottomans burned the island from end to end in 1822 and slaughter or took many of its inhabitants into slavery. On happier news, quite recently, efforts have been exerted to plant new vineyards around the island. Another vineyard among the most important and renowned in Greece was once located on the Thessalian island of Skopelos, the ancient Peparithos. It flourished from antiquity to the 19th century, and during that time, the pace of wine export on the island was brisk. The wine on the vineyards of Samos the island of Pythagoras, produced in antiquity, was equally famous. But Samos wine growing and wine making activities did not rise to prominence until the Byzantine era. Ever since, wine growing on Samos continues to flourish. Samos's superb sweet wine, produced from the white muscat variety, has always been highly acclaimed among Greek wines, making marked presence abroad even at hard times for Greek vineyards. The vineyards of Samos are living proof of the ancient terroir of the Aegean Sea. Using unique wine growing practices, Samos vintners still cultivate their vines on the stone terraces, which are called pezules. On the neighboring island of Icaria, another famous wine was produced in antiquity, Pramnios Enos, a dry red mentioned by Homer, and it was supposed to be the favorite with the Greeks. Who? had not only carried the wine with them to Troy during the 10 year siege, but they had also sold it throughout the northern Aegean. For many a century, 
Pramnius Inus remained vastly popular. Over time, the name came to characterize a wine type and the wine itself was produced in other areas as well, although its name continued to be associated with the Icaria appellation. Now, let's head south to the Aegean islands of Cyclades and their historic vineyards, which are practically everywhere on the Cyclades. The vineyards of Paros, as well as Naxos, Amorgos, Kea and Syros were all famous in ancient times. There were even certain periods in history, such as the centuries of Venetian rule, when the vineyards of the Aegean islands became particularly prominent. However, in one particular island, Sandorini, archaeological evidence points to the existence of wine growing activities even before the devastating eruption of the island's volcano in prehistoric times. The island's extensive wine production, in tandem with the cordial relations it maintained with outsiders, resulted in the fame of Sandorini's wine growing activities remaining unabated, reaching its peak under the Venetian and Ottoman rule as well as during the 19th century, when Sandorini wines would record the largest exports among all other Greek wines. As we've seen in the previous episode with the Philoxera blight, uh, most of uh, vineyards around Europe were devastated, but Sandorini's arid volcanic soil seemed to be hostile to the blight. And not only that, the Sandorinian vintners and wine growers have a unique way of pruning their vines into a wreath-like culura. They also have a few rare native cultivars. One of them is the Assyrtico, one of the most delicious wines you can have from Greece. And of course you have the unique landscape with its coastal terroirs. All of this leads to the importance of protection of the vineyards of Sandorini and some people suggesting even to elevate this, elevate the status to that of a World Heritage uh, Monument. Interesting, eh? Further south, the historic vineyards of the Aegean Islands take us to the Turtacanese. In the vineyards of Rhodes and Kos, the wine-growing tradition, together with wine-making and with wine-commerce, has been deeply entrenched since antiquity. Demand for the wines produced on those two islands reached a peak during the Hellenistic and Roman times. And, in the case of Rhodes, that high demand has remained unchanged. It is interesting to note that um, ancient winemakers harvested relatively late by comparison with modern practice. This was resulting in a stronger wine which was more likely to keep. Typically, the grapes were gathered in pitched baskets. They were first trodden and then pressed. If there wasn't a press available, particularly if we think about the earlier times and uh, smaller farms, it was necessary to extract all the available must by treading. However, treading remained important even when pressing was to follow. Treading breaks up the grapes so that the must will flow more easily. It was typically gathered in a tank, from which it was transferred to a deep fermenting vat. The interior surface of the vat would have been previously fumigated, sealed and aromatized with pitch or resin. Let's talk a little bit about uh, these different grape varieties. Limnio, or Lemnio from Limnus, is a grape which is first mentioned by numerous ancient Greek writers, such as Homer, Hesiod and Polydefkis, and it, this makes it a unique artifact of ancient viticulture. Never mind just the history, but uh, this uh, red variety, which uh, is used to make dry red wines, is still important today, and even so in areas outside of the island of Lemnos, such as in Maronia region, which is in North Greece. Assyrtico is one of these rare white grape varieties that can grow on hot and dry climatic conditions, while at the same time keeping the high alcohol in perfect balance with its crisp acidity. It is more of a textural variety, emphasizing extract, body and structure, rather than aromatic grape. Assyrtico originates, as we've seen, from uh, Sadorini, 
where it makes lean, mineral and very concentrated whites. However, it has been planted to most Greek wine regions, from other Aegean islands to Macedonia and Central Greece and down to the Peloponnese. In these areas, Assyrtiko keeps the crispiness and minerality, but it also shows a higher level of primary fruit aromas and a less dense structure. Finally, Sweet Assyrtiko is a rich, sumptuous, piercing wine. Savatiano is another ancient variety. This is an Athenian and Attic indigenous grape variety, and nowadays is cultivated throughout Greece. The Savatiano grape cultivation and wine production from it reached all the way to the shores of the Black Sea. In the 20th century, this grape variety, unfortunately for the Greek wines' reputation, is interwoven with the infamous Retina wine. And I know for many wine experts and wine snobs, Retina seems to be a really bad cheap wine. And that was sadly because um, it was made really badly and cheaply. <laughs> but it has um, very ancient connections. You know, it, it is said that the ancient Greeks were putting the wine in, into a forai, which was then sealed with the raisin of the pine tree. Gradually found out that the contact of the wine with the raisin would give it a different characteristic smell and aroma. And it seems that this was adopted with great fervor by the Athenian citizens two and a half thousand years ago. So yeah, it was one of the things that kind of... Another wine, another variety of wine, because they were drinking a lot of sweet wines and a lot of the Romans, we know from the Romans, there were smoked wines as well. As we have seen earlier, the lesbian wine was almost uncomparable to any other. It seems that the grape variety Hydriodytico was saved in the nick of time, as phylloxera almost wiped out the vine. Some vine growers managed to discover some remaining in the village of Hydera in the 80s and brought it back to life. This uh, lesbian grape can make red and white wine. Another famous grape is the Black Corinthian, which is of huge importance, historical and financial. And it's a, a variety that is um, where the black resins come from. Almost all the production is dried and exported, but for one small percentage that becomes part of the sweet Mavro Daphne wine nowadays. Mavro Daphne of Patra is a sweet fortified red wine and can contain up to 49% Corinthian key grapes, those black Corinthian grapes we've seen. And it's the same type that's used for the raisins. Hippocrates, the father of medicine, and Aristotle both mention it as it was considered something of a superfood of ancient times. Another famous ancient wine was the Thasian wine, one of the best known of classical Greek appellations. It was in the island of Thasos, and it was a quote-unquote black wine, and it's frequently praised in sources of the 4th century BC. Its fame was maintained later as well, as it's evident from the wide distribution of Thasian amphorae, for which the regular patterns of trade to the Black Sea coast, to Greece, and to wider Mediterranean can be reconstructed. Florentinus, writing in Roman imperial times, gives a recipe for, for imitating Thasian wine. Also, luckily and unusually, an inscription survives laying down rules by which the trade in Thasian wine was regulated in the Hellenistic period. It begins with the memorable words Must or wine, the fruit on the vine shall not be bought before the new moon of Plintaria. Any offending buyer shall pay a fine, stater for stater. Later in the same text, the landing of non-Thasian wine on the southern coast of Thrace is regulated. It is probable that some wine called Thasian was produced on the mainland coast, along which, this mainland coast, the Thasians maintained a string of coastal settlements. There is also the Massilian wine. It is said in the Epitome of Athenaus, in a list originating in the 1st century AD, that the Massilian wine is a fine wine, produced in small quantities, thick and fleshy. Pliny knows of this type, describing it as sappy and fat. He adds that there is another type that might be the one listed by Galen among wines that are light, white, and with little astringency. The Massilian wine was from uh, the modern city of Marseille, which was founded as a Greek colony around 600 BC. 
and uh, Marseille was for many centuries a center of Greek culture in the Western Mediterranean. It was from there that the cultivated vine gradually spread into the southern Gaul and eventually further north. Narbonensian wines were from modern Provence and Languedoc, the Roman provincia, and Gallia Narbonensis. The cultivated grapevine was introduced to the region in all probability by the Greeks of Marseille. By the Roman imperial times, the high quality of some of the wines of Narbonensis and the low quality of other wines from the area too were already noted. There's a little story here, a little anecdote from the ancient times about to which wines were the best. The philosopher and scientist Aristotle, who lived around 384 to 322 BCE and lectured in Athens, was asked on his deathbed to name his successor. The choice lay between Theophrastus of Eresus on Lesbos and Ephdimus of Rhodes. The dying Aristotle sent for Rhodian wine. He tasted it. This is truly a sound and pleasant wine, he said, as he sipped it. Then he asked for a cup of lesbian wine. He sipped that too. Both are very good indeed, he said, but the lesbian is the sweeter. His followers took the gentle hint and appointed Theophrastus as the head of the school. Also, another later writer, the physician Galen, thought that the wine of Theophrastus' hometown in Eresus to be the most aromatic and sweetest of them all. As I said earlier, these wines cannot be found now very easily outside Greece and even in Greece as well. <laughs> you have to go to the local uh, island. I would like to end today's episode with a quote from a long-lost poem called Hidipathia or Life of Luxury of uh, the um, gastronomer Archestratus. This fragment is saved on uh, Athenaeus Dipnosophiste text and it goes like this, from Archester to the writer on banquets. Then, when you have drawn a full measure for Zeus the Saviour, you must drink an old wine with a really grey old head, its moist locks festooned with white flowers, born in Lesbos with the sea all around. I praise Bibling wine from Phoenicia, though it does not equal lesbian. If you take a quick taste of it and are previously unacquainted, it will seem to you to be more fragrant than lesbian, for this lasts for a very long time. When tasted though, it is very inferior, and the lesbian will take on a rank not like wine, but like ambrosia. If some scoff at me, braggarts, perverious of empty nonsense, saying that Phoenician has the sweetest nature of all, I pay no attention to them. Thassos also produce a noble wine to drink, provided it is aged over many good seasons down the years. I know too of the shoots dripping with grape clusters in other cities. I could sign them, praise them, and indeed their names are all well known to me. But the others are simply worthless beside the lesbian wine. Some people, of course, like to praise products from their own locality. For my lovely Patreon backers only, exclusively, I'll uh, give you a couple of recipes where the wine is prominent. And of course, one of them is a recipe for spiced wine or conditum paradoxum. Remember, if you want to get access to the exclusive content, sign up on Patreon where you can find these recipes and much more from £2 per month. Anyway. I will leave it here for you guys and um, hopefully I'll try and recreate these recipes as soon as possible and post them on my Patreon. Thank you for listening. I've been Thomas Dinas and this was the Delicious Legacy Podcast. Join me next time for part three of uh, the history of wine. Let's see where this adventure takes us next. Goodbye. Goodbye.